Well, hey, good morning, and welcome back from spring break. Uh, thank you, Johnny, for that kind introduction. I do have the joy of serving in the Cornerstone Fellowship Group with Harry Walls, and uh, Johnny's there as well, and it's just really a great delight for me to get to be in chapel with you this morning. Johnny mentioned that I have two kids here at the university, Ashley and Isaac, but this morning I actually want to put the spotlight on another family member of mine. I have a niece here at the university, Katie Raper. Uh, today, today is Katie's 20th birthday. Yeah. So, um, if you could, uh, if you could help me win some uncle points with my niece and just make sure and, I don't know, relentlessly tell her happy birthday today, that would be, that would be awesome. So, thank you. All right. Uh, this morning I've chosen a text for our time together that's just a little bit unusual. And in fact, our message this morning will probably be in the spirit of what Dr. Chow calls a lerman, somewhere between a lecture and a sermon. But our text this morning is Leviticus chapter 11. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn there to Leviticus chapter 11. I chose this text in part because I was confident no one else had preached from this text in chapel this year. And it's always good as a guest in chapel to make sure that we're not repeating what somebody else has already preached on. So the text is Leviticus chapter 11, and it is the chapter in which we find the Old Testament dietary laws, the Old Testament dietary laws. And at first glance, Leviticus 11 seems like a bit of an odd choice. But I like Leviticus 11 because I see it as providing us with an opportunity to think about how Christians should approach certain parts of the Old Testament. Because if we're honest, there are passages in the Old Testament that can leave us a little bit confused, can be a little bit challenging for us as we think about how to process them from the perspective of being New Testament Christians. Some time ago, I was talking with a friend about Bible reading plans, and we were talking specifically about reading through the Bible in a year. And in the course of that conversation, we were just noting the fact that so often people start with the new year, they're committed to reading through the Bible in a year, they get a few weeks or maybe a few months in, and those Bible reading plans end up dissipating, usually when people get to this portion of the Pentateuch. It's usually in Leviticus and Numbers that Bible reading plans sometimes go to waste. And so in that sense, much like that first generation that came out of Egypt, many Bible reading plans end up dying in the wilderness. And my question is, why is that? <clears throat> I believe it is often because many Christians today don't know what to do with these portions of Scripture, with a book like Leviticus that's full of prohibitions and prescriptions and details about feasts and priests and sacrifices and all the like. And we can find it challenging to engage with these kinds of details because we're not sure if or how these things pertain to us. And so in that regard, the dietary laws of Leviticus chapter 11 serve as a helpful case study for us. In 2 Timothy 3.16, Paul says that all scripture is inspired and profitable. And he had in mind primarily the Old Testament when he said that. And so if that's true, if all scripture is inspired and profitable, then that must include a passage like Leviticus chapter 11. Now as we approach this text this morning, 
we will do so by asking three questions of this text. And what I'm hoping again to do is use this as a case study for how you should approach any passage in the Old Testament, because these three questions are sort of the basic fundamentals that Christians need to approach the Old Testament text by asking. So these three questions then provide the starting point for how Christians should think about texts like Leviticus chapter 11. And let me overview these questions really quickly this morning, and then we'll apply them to this text. The first question is what I'm calling a historical question. And the historical question is this, we need to ask, what did this text mean for the original author when it was written to its original audience? That's the historical question. And then secondly, we'll ask a theological question, which is what does this passage teach us about who God is and what he expects for his people? That's the theological question. And then finally, we will be able to ask what I'm calling, <clears throat> excuse me, a practical question. And the practical question is then, how does that truth about God relate to us on this side of the cross? So those are our three questions. And with those three questions, we can then begin to examine the text here in Leviticus chapter 11. When we come to the book of Leviticus, we find the Israelites still camped at the foot of Mount Sinai, having recently received the Ten Commandments. For all of you who took Old Testament Survey 1 last semester, or maybe you're in it this semester, uh, this is going to sound like review. But the Israelites are there. They're there at the foot of Mount Sinai. And, uh, of course, Leviticus comes right after the book of Exodus, where we read about and learn about the Israelites and their escape from Egypt. They cross the Red Sea. They make it to Mount Sinai. They tremble before the presence of the Lord there. Moses goes up on the mountain. He's there a long time, and in his absence, they worship a golden calf, and they're judged for that. All of that takes place in the book of Leviticus. Excuse me, in the book of Exodus. But here in Leviticus, the Lord reveals now to the Israelites how they might be in right relationship to him as his covenant people. How can they approach this awesome God the right way? How can they worship him and walk in covenant relationship with him? The book of Leviticus answers those questions does so, of course, within the context of the Mosaic Covenant, but it is necessarily filled with details about sacrifices and the priesthood and the need for atonement, because if a sinful people are to relate to a holy God, their sin must be atoned for. And within the grand storyline of Scripture, we recognize that all of this ultimately points to the Lord Jesus Christ, who is that final sacrifice and that great high priest. Within the flow of the book of Leviticus, chapter 11 obviously comes after chapter 10, and in chapter 10, we have the story of Nadab and Abihu, the two sons of Aaron, who were serving as priests in the tabernacle when they came before the Lord in an unworthy manner and offered to him an unacceptable sacrifice and fire from the presence of the Lord consumed them and they died. It was a reminder to the people that God takes holiness seriously. And coming off of that story in chapter 10, chapter 11 begins a section distinguishing between clean and unclean things between that which is acceptable to God and that which is not. And it begins with the most basic of human needs and human behaviors, and that is the need for food and the act of eating. We see this very quickly as we survey the text. And so with that as a bit of background, we're now ready to dig into Leviticus chapter 11. 
Again, a passage that you probably have never heard a message on before. Leviticus 11, verse 1. The Lord spoke again to Moses and to Aaron, saying to them, Speak to the sons of Israel, saying, These are the creatures which you may eat from all the animals that are on the earth. Whatever divides a hoof, thus making split hooves and choose the cud among the animals that you may eat, Nevertheless, you are not to eat of these among which chew the cud or among those which divide the hoof. The camel, for though it chews the cud, it does not divide the hoof, it is unclean to you. Likewise, the chafin or rock badger, for though it chews the cud, it does not divide the hoof, it is unclean to you. The rabbit also, for though it chews the cud, it does not divide the hoof, it is unclean to you. And the pig... For though it divides the hoof, thus making a split hoof, it does not chew cud, it is unclean to you. You shall not eat of their flesh, nor touch their carcasses, they are unclean to you. You Like this is the weirdest passage that anyone's ever preached from. Well, as these initial verses demonstrate, there were a lot of animals that the Israelites could not eat. And I'm not going to read the rest of all of these prohibitions here in Leviticus chapter 11, but if we were to continue looking through the chapter, we would see that in verses 3 to 8, the Lord addresses the beasts of the field, explaining that while animals like cows are fine to eat, other animals like camels and pigs are off limits. Then in verses 9 to 12, God addresses fish, anything with Fins and scales is edible, but things that do not have fins or scales, these things are not to be eaten, things like shellfish, squid, mollusks, etc. In verses 13 to 19, God addresses birds. Birds like vultures and eagles and owls are all taboo, and although they are not technically birds, bats are also off the menu. Verses 20 to 23 addresses insects, noting that most insects are considered unclean, with the exception of locusts and grasshoppers. Verses 24 to 28 reiterates some of these earlier commands, with the addition that anything that walks on four paws is not to be eaten, so fluffy is not for lunch. Verses 29 to 40, God gives a final category of swarming things, a category that primarily includes rodents and reptiles, so you can't eat moles or rats or mice or lizards or crocodiles. You're not even supposed to touch them. They are completely unclean, so no pet rats, no crocodile boots, etc. It brings us then to verses 41 and 42, where the Lord sums up the previous commands. Leviticus 11:41. Now every swarming thing that swarms on the earth is detestable. It is not to be eaten. Whatever crawls on its belly and whatever walks on all fours, whatever has many feet in respect to every swarming thing that swarms on the earth, you shall not eat them, for they are detestable. And then skip down to verse 46. This is the law regarding the animal and the bird and every living thing that moves in the waters and everything that swarms on the earth to make a distinction between the unclean and the clean and between the edible creature and the creature which is not to be eaten. Now again, at first glance, this passage may seem somewhat confusing and perhaps altogether irrelevant to us as New Testament creatures. After all, the list represents a long itemization of dietary restrictions that was given to ancient Israel, and we're not part of ancient Israel. Jesus made it very clear in Mark chapter 7 that these dietary restrictions do not apply to us. But, as we already read from 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is inspired and profitable for reproof, for correction, for encouragement, for training in righteousness. So how is this chapter profitable for us as Christians? 
Well, let's go back to our three questions and let's use them to look at this text. First, let's consider the historical question, which is the question, what did this text mean for the original audience? What did it mean for Moses, the author, and the Israelites? Well, the immediate implication of this text for them is that there were a lot of things that they were not allowed to eat. It's very clear that there is a long list of taboo food items for the Israelites. Many of those things, of course, we would agree are probably not things we would want to put in our mouths, right? They are to avoid bats and vultures and rodents and camels and lizards and bugs and other creepy crawlies, and we would probably all affirm that those are proteins that we would want to avoid. But there are other items on the list that even just after breakfast, a few hours before lunch, still might make us a bit hungry this morning. The Israelites could not eat pork or shellfish, which meant no bacon, no ham, no pork chops, no crab, no shrimp, no calamari, no lobster. The Israelites could not eat any of those things, and even today, those who observe a kosher diet still avoid eating those foods based on these restrictions here in Leviticus chapter 11. But the question I think we need to ask is why? Why does God put these prohibitions on his people here as they come out of the land of Egypt and get ready to go into the promised land? Well, some have suggested that perhaps The reason for this is that there were sanitary and kind of health concerns that God had in mind, and perhaps that is part of it. There certainly would be some concern with some of these things. If you you ate them, they wouldn't be very sanitary. Others have suggested that there's a sense here in which God wants to ensure that his people are depending on him for their sustenance. They're out in the wilderness right now, and perhaps the temptation was to hunt down a mouse or kill a rock badger and eat that for breakfast or lunch. And God's saying, no, I want you to depend on me, right? In Exodus 16, God gives them manna, which was a miraculous provision for them in the wilderness. But the primary reason that God wanted the Israelites to avoid these foods is actually stated in the text And I skipped over these verses, but I want you to look back at Leviticus chapter 11, verses 43 to 45, because here God tells us why he is restricting the menu. Verse 43, do not render yourselves detestable through any of the swarming things that swarm, and you shall not make yourselves unclean with them so that you become unclean, for I am the Lord your God, Consecrate yourselves, therefore, and be holy, for I am holy. And you shall not make yourselves unclean with any of the swarming things that swarm on the earth, for I am the Lord who brought you up from the land of Egypt to be your God, that you shall be holy, for I am holy. The entire book of Leviticus is about how a sinful people a nation comprised of unholy individuals can approach a holy God in worship and walk with him in covenant relationship. And God's primary point to the Israelites is that if you're going to be my people, you must consecrate yourselves. Your behavior must reflect my holiness, and that includes watching what you eat. Now, it will take them a while to get there because this particular generation for its disobedience will die in the wilderness and it will be the next generation that actually goes into the promised land, the land of Canaan. But as God anticipates their entry into the promised land, he's calling them to be distinct in their behavior and to separate themselves from the pagan rituals and pagan practices that characterize the surrounding nations. It's so true that even in our 
modern era, we associate certain foods with certain cultures. If I say lasagna, you think of a particular part of the world. If I say sweet and sour shrimp, you think of another part of the world because the food is associated with the culture. And here God is calling his people to be distinct from the pagan cultures that would have gladly eaten any of the items that were prohibited here in Leviticus 11. And so one of the key ways that Israel can demonstrate its separation is by having a diet that was very different. Their eating practices would be noticeably distinct from the pagan nations around them, and as such, it would serve as a daily reminder that they were separated, consecrated, holy unto God. So that meant no bacon cheeseburgers, no shrimp alfredo, no clam chowder, no crab cakes, but instead at every meal, a reminder that they had been separated unto God as his people. And not only that, but a continual testimony to the nations around them that Israel is different. Well, that brings us to our second question, the historical question, what did this mean for Israel? It meant a very distinct diet as a reflection of the fact that they belong to God. Second question is our theological question, and that is, what does this passage teach us about the person and character of God himself and about his expectations for his people? A theological question, what does this passage teach us about God. I like Leviticus chapter 11 because the theological question, the truth about God taught in this text is explicit in the text itself. In every Old Testament passage, there's implicit truth about God being revealed. In this passage, it is explicit. And we just looked at these verses, but look again at verse 44 and verse 45. Because here is the theological truth that is being revealed. God says, for I am Yahweh, I am the Lord your God. Consecrate yourselves therefore and be holy for I am holy. You shall not make for yourselves, you shall not make yourselves unclean with any of the swarming things that swarm on the earth, verse 45, for I am the Lord who brought you up from the land of Egypt to be your God, that you should be holy, for I am holy. In keeping, of course, with the entire theme of the book of Leviticus, the emphasis of this passage is on the holiness of God. The term holiness in its most basic sense means otherness or separateness. And when the Bible speaks of God's holiness, it is emphasizing the fact that he is completely separate from, other than distinct from his creation. He alone is God, the creator, the king of the universe. And so he is uniquely set apart He's in a category all his own. As Isaiah said in Isaiah 6, 3, actually it was the angels surrounding the throne who proclaimed this, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The earth is full of his glory. Now when holiness is being used to speak of moral categories, when it's used in a moral or ethical context, the holiness of God refers to the fact that he is completely separate from sin. He is completely separate from impurity of any kind. He's absolutely perfect, perfectly pure, and altogether righteous. And in keeping with his moral perfection, he expects and calls his people to reflect his character in terms of holiness. So if the Israelites were to approach him in worship that was acceptable and to walk with him in covenant relationship, they had to consecrate themselves, separating themselves from any hint 
of moral impurity and from any stain of ceremonial defilement. They were to be holy as he is holy. They were to be holy as a reflection of his perfect holiness. It was about a thousand years after this that you'll remember Daniel was taken to Babylon. And in chapter one of Daniel, Daniel and his friends were presented with all sorts of food from the king's table. Many of the things that were offered were things that were forbidden because of Leviticus chapter 11. And Daniel, seeking to honor the Lord, refused the king's food and God honored him. Daniel chapter one, by the way, is not about being vegan or vegetarian or any of those things. It's about the fact that Daniel honored the Lord and the Lord blessed Daniel as a result. Well, that brings us then to our third question this morning. The historical question, what did this text mean for ancient Israel? It meant we can't eat a lot of stuff because we're supposed to be distinct. What does this passage teach us about who God is? That's the theological question. It teaches us that God is holy and he expects his people to reflect his holiness. Well, the third question we're asking ourselves this morning is the practical question. And that question is, how does that truth about who God is and what he expects, how does that truth impact us on this side of the cross? How is a passage like Leviticus 11 practical for us as New Testament believers? Well, certainly the theological truth that is found in this chapter is intensely practical. There could be hundreds of ways that we could think about the implications of what it means that God is holy and that he calls his people to walk in holiness. But this morning, I want to highlight two specific implications. Two specific implications because the New Testament actually points back to Leviticus chapter 11 in two different places that I think are very significant. So if you would, go ahead and turn from Leviticus chapter 11 all the way to Acts chapter 10. We'll see our first implication there. It's an implication that relates to our conversion as Christians. Our conversion as Christians. This is Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10, again, is an account that I'm confident all of you are familiar with. It's the historical record of Peter being called by God to take the gospel to the Gentiles, in this case, to the house of Cornelius. The Gentiles were considered unclean, And Peter, as someone who had grown up Jewish, would have been reluctant, in fact, he was reluctant, to even enter a Gentile household because it would have defiled him ceremonially. And again, a lot of that goes back to passages like Leviticus chapter 11, where the unclean food food actually represented and almost personified the pagan, unclean nations that surrounded Israel. Peter is there in Acts chapter 10, verse 9, and God does something extraordinary to show him that he needs to go and preach the gospel to the Gentiles. On the next day, as they were on their way approaching the city, Peter went up on the housetop about the sixth hour to pray. But he became hungry and was desiring to eat. But while they were making preparations, he fell into a trance. And he saw the sky opened up and an object like a great sheet coming down, lowered by four corners to the ground. And there were in it all kinds of four-footed animals and crawling creatures of the earth and birds of the air. And a voice came to him, get up, Peter, 
kill and eat. But Peter said, by no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything unholy and unclean. And again, a voice came to him a second time. What God has cleansed, no longer consider unholy. This happened three times, and immediately the object was taken into the sky. Now, I think this is fascinating that God himself uses the very dietary laws that he prescribed in Leviticus 11. He uses those very laws to compel Peter to go and preach the gospel to the Gentiles, to show Peter that what once was considered unclean, God had cleansed, and therefore it was no longer considered unholy. Now granted, I love Acts chapter 10 because I love bacon cheeseburgers, but I appreciate Acts chapter 10 more than that because it illustrates the glory of the gospel. Peter, who normally would have refused this invitation because, again, he had grown up as a law-abiding Jew, he would have refused to even enter the house of a Gentile. He is now shown by God himself that he is to go and enter the house of Cornelius and preach the gospel to the Gentiles. And if we were to read the rest of chapter 10, we would see that he does go and he proclaims the good news of the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And Cornelius and his family are converted. They believe and they are saved. And they receive the Holy Spirit, and then they are baptized and received into the church. And even in chapter 11 of Acts, when Peter goes back to Jerusalem and reports all of this to his fellow elders there at the church in Jerusalem, they are amazed that God has granted even to the Gentiles the repentance that leads to life. Can't overemphasize the fact that From a Jewish perspective, from an Old Testament perspective, the Gentile pagan nations were off limits. They were unclean. What a vivid picture this is then, especially for those of us who are from Gentile backgrounds. Because here's the thing. As that sheet is lowered down from heaven and Peter peers over the edge of it and he sees on that blanket stretched out all of the gross, creepy, crawly things that give us kind of the jitters just to think about them. The swine and the snakes and the scorpion and the squid all kind of just squirming on that sheet. That is a picture of us. That is a picture of us. In Leviticus 11, those forbidden foods actually represent the pagan nations, and in Acts chapter 10, those forbidden foods, again, represent the pagan Gentile nations. And the glory of the gospel is that God says, what I have cleansed, no longer consider unclean. And how is it that God can take the ugly, disgusting, detestable, gross things of this world and transform them into new creatures? It's only because of the work of that final sacrificial lamb that Leviticus points to, the work of the great high priest that Leviticus points to, that you and I, who were the detestable, the unclean, the unholy, the unworthy, have been cleansed such that through faith in Christ, we have become new creations in him. Well, there's 
much more that we could say from Acts 10, but I want to show you a second implication. So there's an implication for your conversion as a Christian, and then secondly, there's an implication for your conduct as a Christian. We're going to stick with Peter, so I'll have you turn one more time from Acts chapter 10 to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. Speaking again of the implications of Leviticus 11 and the theological truth that it proclaims about the holiness of God for your life as a New Testament believer. Leviticus 11 teaches us that God is holy. Acts chapter 10 reminds us that you are not, and yet in Christ, you who were unclean have been cleansed. Now in light of that, 1 Peter chapter 1 reminds us that our conduct must be consistent with the reality that we are new creatures in Christ. So 1 Peter chapter 1 Look at verses 13 to 16. Therefore, Peter says, prepare your minds for action, keep sober in spirit, fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, verse 14, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance, But like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves in all your behavior because, verse 16, it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. Isn't that interesting? Here Peter quotes from Leviticus 11, 44 and 45 in order to make the point That even as New Testament Christians, we are to live in light of the holiness of God. We are to put off the lusts that used to characterize us when we walked in the darkness. And we are to put on Christ and walk in the light. So Peter takes the theological truth of Leviticus and he applies it to New Testament believers. And in the following verses, verses 17 to 19, he actually draws parallels with Old Testament Israel. They were liberated from slavery in Egypt. We have been liberated from slavery to sin. They were redeemed through the blood of a lamb on a doorpost. We have been redeemed from the blood of the lamb who died on the cross. For Israel, the application of the truth of Leviticus 11 included not eating certain things because their distinct diet indicated that they were separated and consecrated unto God. And for us, we're no longer under the Mosaic law, so those same dietary restrictions do not apply, but the principle is still very much in force We are to be holy in our conduct. Not because it earns us anything. We we deserve nothing. We just saw that in Acts 10. But because as those who have been transformed as new creatures in Christ, we are to live now not as detestable, unholy things, but as those who are consecrated unto the Lord. We are to be holy because he is is holy. Again, Nadab and Abihu, I mentioned their names earlier. They're all the way back in Leviticus chapter 10. They serve as such an interesting contrast to the way that we have been called to live. They demonstrate the reality that God requires holiness even in the way that he is worshiped and also in the way that we walk in our daily lives. Much like Ananias and Sapphira in Acts chapter five, they serve as a vivid reminder of the fact that God takes the holiness of his people seriously. Hebrews 12, 28 and 29 
says that we are to offer to God an acceptable service with awe and reverence for God is a consuming fire. So God takes your holiness very, very seriously because again, if you have been redeemed through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, you are a new creation in him The old things have passed away. All things have become new. And you are to walk now in newness of life, the fruit of that transformation, seen in your conduct, seen in your behavior, so that you reflect the character of the God who saved you. And I know your theme this year is salt and light, but how can you be salt if you're not pure? And how can you be light if you don't shine? The reflection of God's holiness becomes a powerful witness to a watching world. All of this then brings us back to the heart of Leviticus because the book of Leviticus is about how a sinful people can relate in a saving covenant relationship with a holy God. Regarding Leviticus 11 specifically, we've asked ourselves three questions this morning. And again, I think these same three questions ought to be asked of every text in the Old Testament. The historical question, what did this passage mean for the original audience written by the original author? And the answer to that in Leviticus 11 is there's a lot of stuff Israel can't eat because they are to be different. The theological question, what does this teach us about who God is and what he expects of his people? It teaches us that God is holy and he expects his people to reflect his character in the way that they live. And he cares about that in every detail of life to the point where he would actually prescribe rules for eating in the Old Testament. And then we ask the practical question, how does that truth about who God is and what he expects, how does that relate to us as New Testament believers? And we saw two implications from the New Testament specifically. Acts chapter 10, there are implications for how we understand conversion. And 1 Peter 1, there are implications for how we think about our conduct. Acts chapter 10 reminds us that we were unclean, but we have been cleansed through Christ. And 1 Peter 1.16 reminds us that if we are new creatures in Christ, we are to walk in a manner worthy of the gospel. I'm really glad that the dietary laws of Leviticus 11 are no longer in effect. Uh, I would probably be healthier if they were still in effect, but I'm really glad that they're not. Those restrictions were temporal. They were only for Israel within Israel's specific context. But the truth that these restrictions and regulations teach us about God, the truth of his holiness is eternal. The standard of his perfect character never changes. He takes his holiness seriously and he expects his people to reflect that holiness in every aspect of life. So where this gets really practical is thinking about what you watch, where you go on the internet, how you spend your free time, what happens in your thought life, your self-discipline, your time management, your work ethic, your study habits, your relationships, your words, your sense of humor, your priorities, your pursuits. If you take an assessment of your life, assume the posture of an outside observer watching you. Would they conclude 
after seeing what you do, how you talk, how you spend your time, that your life is distinct and different and separate and consecrated, that your life reflects the holiness of the one who saved you. In Mark chapter 7, you don't need to turn there, but in Mark chapter 7, verses 14 to 22, Jesus makes it clear that those Old Testament dietary laws are no longer in effect. But in that passage, he says that God cares far more about what is going on in your heart than he does about what you put into your mouth. You shall be holy, for he is holy. Big idea from this text, God is holy. He expects his people to reflect that holiness. Practical implication, if you're saved, you are no longer unclean, you've been cleansed. And if you've been cleansed, you need to walk in a way that's consistent with who you are in Christ. The question I'll leave you with this morning is, are you being faithful to live that out? Let's pray. Father, thank you for the truth of your word, the truth about yourself that's revealed in this text. Father, we know that we fall far short of your perfect standard. We have failed so often, and it's why we need a savior the Lord Jesus Christ, our perfect substitute, that final sacrificial lamb, the great high priest who intercedes on our behalf. And so, Lord, we find our refuge in him because when we think about your holiness, we know that we are so unworthy. And yet, Lord, as those who have been cleansed by grace through faith, we ask that by your grace, we would walk in a manner worthy of the gospel so that we might reflect the character of the one who saved us. We're so grateful for your son, and we pray these things today in his name. Amen.